um, welcome everyone to the final CCMV seminar this semester. Um, I will just um, give a brief introduction of our speaker and then we can start. Um, so yeah, today's speaker is Dr. Joachim Lange from the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. Um, he obtained his PhD from the Philips University in Marburg where he studied the perception of biological motion. And then he went on to do postdocs at the Donners Institute in Nijmegen and the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. And since 2012, he's um, now a group leader um, at the Heinrich Heine University at the Institute for Clinical Neuroscience and Medical Psychology. And he does research on the influence of ongoing neuronal oscillations on perception, um, which he will share with us today. And I just want to add that we are especially happy to have him here today because we already invited him uh, twice before to give a talk in the CCMB meeting. Um, this was still when the seminar was uh, held in presence in Berlin. And both times we had to cancel because of massive storms that prevented all trains from going. So uh, we, yeah, we're very glad to have him here today. And um, we hope that the internet connection will hold so that we can finally hear his talk. Um, yeah, so you, uh, you've already shared your slides, so you can just go ahead and start. Yeah, thanks a lot, Pia, for the nice introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here to give my talk finally. I think there is a, a English saying, um, third time is a charm, which is really uh, fitting here today. Okay, so um, in my talk, I want to talk, uh, I want to present you some work about uh, what I call the rhythms of perception. So the general idea behind my, my research is, um, or the, the problem is that our perception is limited. So we know this from visual perception. So usually we can't see the things at the molecular or even atomal level. Um, or if you look at this picture here, um, you can imagine that there are lots of people, thousands of people, but if you take a closer look, then you can actually see that you can hardly see any of these people here. So you cannot recognize any faces or so, or any individual persons. So this is all because our perception is limited. So especially our um, spatial perception. Um, so, and also we know that our perception can vary. So for example, if you look at these three letters here and i will would like to uh, i will ask you what is the letter in the center most of you will probably say it's a b and if i present it like this and ask you what is the letter in the center you will probably say it's 13. so although this is always the same uh, symbol or sign here so this shows you that even if perception is constant um or if the stimulus is constant our perception can vary so it can vary yeah, as, I, as I've shown you, can vary due to prior expectations or prior knowledge, but it, it can also vary spontaneously, or it can vary across subjects, or it can vary um, uh, spontaneously within a single subject. So, for example, if you look here at this famous ambiguous figure of a so-called Rubin base, then you see, you can see either in the middle, this, um, where is it here? Yeah. You can see this white base, or you can see on the left or on the right side, these black faces looking to the middle, right? So this perception is either, usually either the base or the faces, and it can spontaneously vary across, over time. So these examples show you that, as I said before, on the one hand, our perception is limited, and on the other hand, it can vary. So this shows that our brain is not a real, uh, not a deterministic machine where you get a physical input, put it into the brain, and uh, you get some perception out as an output. But rather, um, our brain does something with this incoming stimuli. And even if these stimuli this, uh, are physically identical, as you can see here, you can have can get varying perception in the end. So in my research, I am uh, investigating what are the neural mechanisms of these limitations and of these variations. So um, what other people have done before um, they uh, to study these 
um, limited perception is that they took so-called near threshold stimuli. So here's an example from a really seminal um, work by my former colleague Hanneke van Dijk. So here in this study, they used uh, these gray circles. And if you look closer, then you can see within this gray circle, there's another gray circle with a slightly different contrast. So in this study, Hanneke and colleagues, uh, they uh, modulated the contrast between these two stimuli so that the subjects could barely see this difference. So they actually manipulated it so that they could see it in 70% of all trials. So that is important. They always used the same stimulus here, but in 70% the subjects could see this, um, this inner circle and in 30% they simply missed it, although it's always the identical stimulus. So what Van Dyke and colleagues did, they looked at, uh, they measured brain activity with MEG, and then they looked at, uh, specifically at alpha power. And what you can see here, uh, this is from the pre-stimulus uh, period. So just before the stimulus was presented, you can see that there is a difference here in alpha power between misses and hits. So in, in trials where they missed this inner circle, and in trials where they really could detect, detect it. And you can see that alpha power is lower here in this hit trials than it was in the misses trials. So there is a difference in alpha. So pre-stimulus alpha power seems to modulate near threshold perception. So this finding has been replicated by now in several studies. Here's just one example from Nico Bush and Van Rohn, um, where they find a similar effect, but note here in this study they uh, analyzed hits versus misses where in this it was misses versus hits you just see the opposite effect here right so but i said this is um, um more or less standard finding so that in near threshold perceptual task pre-stimulus alpha modulates the perception the lower um, pre-stimulus alpha power the better your perception okay so, but not only the spatial perception is limited usually, but also our temporal perception. So um, in the temporal modality, or we cannot be infinitely good, but there are certain limits. So you can see this, for example, if you look at a spinning top here. So if it's a still picture, you can see here this picture of these children. But when we start it, start it, start it, start it, well, it doesn't start. Okay, just a second. Hmm. Okay, so now, so if it starts rotating, then you cannot see this still pictures of these children anymore. But rather, you see some kind of a blurred picture on the spinning top. And this is due to the fact that our temporal perception is really limited. So at some point, we cannot resolve all these um, fast rotating images. And it looks like just like a motion blur. Okay. So um, in my studies, I was in specifically interested in these limits in temporal discrimination, so in temporal perception. So um, we used. Um, yeah, um, a very simple paradigm here in, in my previous studies. So, uh, what I would like to present you in my in my talk now is first of all uh, some older studies where we looked at these um, neural mechanisms neural mechanisms of temporal perception, and later on I will present you some current work we are doing on this topic. So, first of all, some older works. So, in this study, we used them. Pretty simple design, pretty simple paradigm. So we just presented two visual stimuli to our um, to our participants, and these were presented in rapid succession, one after the other, and we adapted the SOA, so the stimulus onset asynchrony between these two stimuli, so that um, subjects uh, had really a hard time to perceive these two stimuli. So in only fifty percent of all trials, they really could really perceive these two stimuli. While in the other 50%, they just perceived one stimulus. 
So here we have now again something what I talked about at the beginning about this kind of ambiguous fingers and figures. So we have a kind of an ambiguous stimulus here. So the physical input to the brain is always identical, but the output can vary um, across trials. So what we were interested in now again is the um, neuronal activity. So we measured uh, participants' brain activity using MEG. And what we found here in the study is pretty similar to, to what Van Dyck and others found for the spatial, for the near threshold uh, stimuli. So we found that alpha power is pre stimulus alpha power is modulated here. So it modulates the perception. The lower pre stimulus alpha power is, the better the perception. So the more often subjects could perceive two stimuli. And if they only perceived one stimulus, they had a high alpha power. So Similar result for our temporal discrimination task, as has been found before for the, the near threshold task. Okay. So then we went on to see whether we found a similar pattern in the somatosensory modality. So when we now take two tactile or electrotactile stimuli, so on the left index finger, and again we modulated the stimulus onset asynchrony between those two stimuli so that subjects could only perceive the two stimuli in 50% and the, in the other 50% they only perceived one stimulus. Okay, So pretty similar to the study before and as you might have guessed, we again um, recorded neuronal activity with MEG. And again we found the same result. Um, if, we, if we contrast all trials with two um, perception of two stimuli versus perception of one stimulus, we again find uh, found the decrease of alpha power. And now this is located more in the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay. So, and in a third uh, study, in the third task, we now use something called double flash illusion. So we wanted to study multisensory processes, visual tactile processes. So in this double flash illusion, people uh, in this original uh, um, illusion, um, uh, discovered by Shams and colleagues, they presented one visual stimulus accompanied by two auditory stimuli. So, and, and if these three stimuli are presented within an, a specific temporal range, so usually within 70 milliseconds, then subjects frequently have the illusion of perceiving a second um, visual stimulus, a second visual flash. So it has been later shown that this also works for uh, visual tactile stimuli, and we use this paradigm, visual tactile para paradigm, for our study. So in this paradigm, subjects received one tactile stimulus on the left index finger, then we flashed one visual stimulus, and then again a tactile stimulus. And again, we modulated the SOA so that every single individual subject um, received this illusion in roughly 50% of all trials, while in the other 50%, it did not perceive the illusion. So only this one theoretical visual stimulus. And surprise, surprise, again, we did MEG and recorded neuronal activity. And again, we found the same pattern here. So again, we found a decrease in alpha activity when subjects perceived two stimuli. So, but, Here's one important difference to these other two, stimul uh, two uh, results. So while here in this visual and then this tactile task, it looked like um, low alpha power is good for veridical perception. So the real, so you really perceive what is presented, the two visual stimuli or the two tactile stimuli. Here in this visual tactile illusion task, it was the other way around. So with the two, so with low alpha, you perceive the illusion, so not the veridical um, stimulus. And the veridical stimulus was better perceived if alpha power was high. So in this, um, if you look at this from this point of view, it's kind of the opposite effect here. But on the other hand, you could say the lower the alpha power, the more stimuli one would perceive. So this is why we said, why we speculated in our study, that low alpha power does not really reflect better perception in terms of more veridical perception, but 
alpha power is an indicator of um, kind of excitability of a visual cortex or somatosensory cortex. So if you have low alpha power, that is high excitability, and then you will get two unimodal stimuli, you can perceive or process them better. But if you have low alpha power, that is high excitability in visual cortex, and then you will receive one visual stimulus, but also input from somatic sensory to cortex to visual cortex, then this can be better integrated and this in the end leads to, to um, the illusion. So rather than better perception per se, this would be higher excitability, which sometimes can lead to better perception and sometimes can lead to illusionary perception. Okay. So let me summarize these first older studies. So we know from, I haven't shown you this, but we know from a lot of studies that alpha power correlates with attention. Then I've shown you from the Van Dyck study and others that it also correlates with near frontal perception. And we could show in our studies that it also correlates with temporal discrimination ability across modalities. Okay. So we suggested that it's not better perception per se, but higher excitability. Others argued like uh, Yemi or Limbach, they said it's not really better perception or better excitability, but rather a bias because they found that not only your perception improves with lower alpha, but also your false alarm rate. So in the end, your sensitivity doesn't really change, but your false alarm, but also your hit rate. So in the end, it's a shift of a bias towards perceiving two stimuli. Another set like uh, Ole Jensen's group, alpha power might, um, might be a gating mechanism so that it kind of gates your neuronal activity, uh, the pathway of new, your neuronal activity. But no matter which way you look at it, um, you always find that all these studies find a correlation between alpha power and perception. So, and we know, uh, we all know about the fallacy of misinterpreting a correlation as causality, but still we quite often do this. So, and a lot of these studies maybe kind of treat alpha power as a causal reason for, for changing perception. But is this really the case? Do we really have a causality here or just a correlation? We don't really know. So to get a, bit, a little bit closer to this causality, we designed another study. So we thought, okay, why not measure MEG, uh, measure neuronal activity with MEG, and then measure or uh, compute alpha power instantaneously from, from the ongoing MEG recordings. And whenever we detect that the alpha power is low, so that it, if it is um, below a certain lower threshold, then we just present this stimulus, this Van Dyck stimulus. So, and our hypothesis was if it's low, of course, then people should see this inner circle. So, and if we go on, and then uh, if we detect a high alpha power, so above a certain threshold, then we present this weak stimulus, and then people should not see this inner stimulus. Okay, so this is not really clear, straightforward causality, but a little bit closer to this. So here's the control. So if we then later on offline um, separate the trials in, in low and high alpha trials, then we see that we were successful. Um, and this effect is mainly seen in the right to occipital regions. So just like as expected. So what is now the, the influence of these power modulations or power differences on, on the perception? So here we look now at all single subjects. We have 20 subjects and we look at the detection improvement. That is, we look at the perception at low power trials versus minus the perception at high power trials. So what would we expect? We would expect something like this. So we would expect that in lower trials, in trials with low alpha power, people are better 
of perception than in the other way. And maybe we would not expect this ideal world that all subjects have an improvement, but something similar to this. So, but we, what we actually saw was this. So there were only like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven out of 20 subjects, which really showed this expected improvement. While 13 showed an impairment of perception despite low alpha activity. And um, if you take a closer look, you see that most of them are cl pretty close to zero, which means no change of perception, regardless whether alpha power is high or low. So that is a bit surprising and a bit um, in contrast to our hypothesis and in contrast to what most studies sh have shown so far. So. Here's an, another view on the same result. And now we look at the percentage seen here um, across all subjects for the low power trials and for the high power trials. And yeah, of course, you see, you see the same pattern. There's not the hypothesized improvement of detection rates for low power. So, and if you look at the p-value of the statistical test, this is not even close to a trend or something or a significant difference. So we're pretty far away from any effect here. Okay, so we, we did a, a few control studies. So the first idea we had was uh, maybe our paradigm didn't work properly. So we, we adapted the Van Dyke paradigm as close as possible, but we had to do some minor changes. So we thought, okay, maybe these minor changes lead to this unexpected result. So we did control studies by simply replicating the Van Dyck study. And yeah, first of all, we did it with a short pre-stimulus baseline. So we had a, a, a kind of a cue, a green fixation dot indicating, okay, the, the actual stimulus will come up in one to 1 1.5 seconds. So which is pretty close to the Van Dyck study, which used like two and two and a half seconds. But nevertheless, we see actually the opposite effect. When we contrast the seen versus not seen trials, we, do, we see higher power in the seen trials, which was really surprising to us. So we thought, okay, maybe it's the length of the pre baseline, so we prolong the baseline. And then if we take a longer baseline, um, something randomly chosen between minus two and minus seven seconds, then we could e nicely replicate the Van Dyck studies, even with a, here at this time, uh, we had a really low number of subjects, like 12 subjects, 13, 13, but we, anyway, nevertheless, we see, already we see this replication effect of the Van Dyck study. So it seems to be, so we can replicate the results, but we, with a slight manipulation of the pre stimulus baseline, we see the opposite effect. And if we try to do the step towards the causality, then we see no effect of alpha power anymore. So what does that mean? Does that mean all these previous studies, including my own studies, should be thrown to the garbage bin? Probably not. So, but what does it mean? Is there no real causality between pre-stimulus alpha power and perception? So maybe alpha power is just a byproduct of attention and sometimes attention modulates perception, then we see this effect. Sometimes attention has no effect on perception. Then we see a um, disentangling effect of alpha power and perception. We don't really know. And, or maybe there are many alpha rhythms. So, Maybe we can look at one alpha rhythm which modulates perception. We have another alpha rhythm which indicates or indexes attention. And sometimes these two overlaps, sometimes these yeah, represent different mechanisms in the brain. So this idea is not new. So for example, Christopher Gundler brought this idea up. So um, I want to years ago in a study where he actually also modulated alpha power related to attention, and he found uh, the expected effect on attention and on alpha, alpha power, but no correlation between this modulation of alpha power and perception, so similar to our results here. So finally, my conclusion is 
we don't really know why we found this contradictory result to, to the previous studies. And to be on the safe side, I would say at this point, future studies are needed to, to find out about this relationship between alpha power and perception. Um, okay, so now I would like to focus on a, on a slightly different aspect. So as we have seen before, um, if we move this spinning top here, then we cannot see these static images anymore. We just see a kind of a motion blur on the spinning top, okay? Um, we see something similar if we take a photo, a photo uh, with, of something that is moving fastly. For example, like here um, on the highway, if we take a photo with our camera or um, smartphone, then we see um, kind of a motion smear on this picture. And this motion smear or motion blur is due to the exposure time of, of the camera. So the longer the exposure time, the longer the smear, the shorter the exposure time, the, the shorter the smear. So that is because yeah, the lens is open for a certain time and it kind of integrates all the input over this time. It is open and this is then the integrated final image. So um, there's been an idea proposed um, that maybe our perception works similar to how a video camera works. So taking the static frames. So for example, imagine you um, watching the Winter Olympics on TV and you look, for example, here watch figure skating and you see this nice, fast, continuous movement. Then you also have the impression that you, in your brain, there is this um, continuous movement, but is this really the case? So it also could be that our um, perception or brain works similar to this video cameras and takes static snapshots of this, um, of our environment or of this input. And then at some point in the brain, this is again kind of integrated or put together and then we have the, um, just the impression of a movement. So this idea is not new, so it has been proposed more than thousands of years ago by a Buddhist school um, uh, who said that our perception in fact is discontinuous and the continuous perception is just an illusion. And if you are good at meditation, then you actually can access these static discontinuous frames. Um, also in early psychology, more than 100 years ago, there was an ongoing discussion whether our perception is really continuous, like the great psychologist James said, uh, he said our perception it flows, it's a river or stream. While others said, like the Bergson said, no, we take snapshots, snapshots of the passing reality. So and also in recent years, there have been a lot of studies which um, implicitly or explicitly uh, stated that there might be some kind of perceptual temporal windows of perception. Um, and this idea of temporal windows where incoming information is integrated over time is also very popular in multisensory perception. So in my studies now, um, we wanted to test this uh, with thesis, whether there is kind of discrete discontinuous perception going on in our brain and this continuous um, perception we all experience every day whether this is just an illusion then. So again, we used our pretty simple paradigm here. So again, our subjects received two uh, electrotactile stimuli. Again, we adjusted the SOA so that we have a 50-50 balanced perception here. And again, we measured uh, brain activity with MHC. So our hypothesis is now, if our brain works in these discrete static perceptual frames, so then if these two stimuli, they coincidentally fall within one frame, then they will be integrated over time. And our percept would be just one stimulus. But if they coincidentally fall into two uh, cycles, then we would have the perception of two. Yeah. 
So, and yeah, based on the previous studies, we, we investigated the hypothesis that these static or discrete frames, they should be reflected by neuronal oscillations in a specific frequency band. So one cycle of the neuronal oscillation would then represent one, one cycle or yeah, of these perceptual frames. So from this model, um, we could derive a prediction. So we could say, if subjects perceive one stimulus, then we sh should expect something like this. But if they perceive two stimuli, we should expect a shift of these um, of these neuronal oscillations. So in the end, if we would look at the phase of these neuronal oscillations, we should see a phase shift between all trials where we perceive two and all these trials where we perceived one stimulus. So this is what we analyzed, and here you can see the result. So here on the x-axis you see time, and you see time point zero is the time point of the actual stimulus, so we are in the pre-stimulus period here. And on the y-axis, you see the frequencies. And what we did now, we did a statistical test of the phases, whether the phases differ between trials where they perceive two versus trials where they perceived one stimulus. And what you see here, this red blob, this red cluster here, this indicates that here is a significant difference of phase between these two perceptual states. So that is, if we look a little bit closer here, this figure tells us there is a significant difference. And here we could quantify the difference. And you see that for trials with a perception of one and trials with a perception of two, the phase is almost opposite of each other. So and that is exactly what our model print has predicted here, right? If you remember, we just predicted from this perceptual frame theory that we should see a shift of these um, of these phases. Okay, so this is pretty nice, pretty much in line with our model prediction. So next we wanted to yeah, go a little step closer to this causality. So we wanted to modulate these perceptual frames and we thought we could modulate them by presenting an additional stimulus right in front of these target stimuli. So in this additional stimulus, it should reset neuronal oscillations. So, but it's a little bit tricky to do this with um, um, with um, electrotactile stimuli because any electrotactile stimulus presented before could easily be mixed up with this target stimuli and then not just be a modulating stimulus before but counted as a target stimulus by the participant. So we thought we could use a subliminal stimulus. So a stimulus below perceptual threshold. So this, is uh, by defini per definition not perceived by these uh, by the subjects, so it cannot be mixed up with this target stimuli. But yet, based on previous studies, for example, by the Palva group, we we had the idea or a hope that this subliminal stimulus is sufficient to modulate um, to reset phases. So, what would we expect now by from presenting this subliminal stimulus? So we presented it with varying SOAs here between stimulus, supplement stimulus and target stimuli. So one idea could be supplement stimulus, it's below perceptual threshold, so it does not influence perception at all. So we would see a flat line here. So you can imagine um, that it's not that way. Otherwise my talk would be over at this point, or at least for this study. So, but um, we could also imagine that with shorter SOA, perception gets worse, or vice versa, with shorter SOAs, um, perception gets better. And we can have a look at what our model here predicts. So our model would say, um, yeah, here we present the subliminal stimulus and it, it induces a phase reset. So a phase reset means our perceptual frames restart here at this point. So by coincidence here, these two target stimuli fall into one cycle, so we get a perception of one. So now we can move this modulating stimulus a little bit closer here to the target stimuli. 
So a fa the phase reset occurs at a slightly later time point, and here these two stimuli now fall into two frames. So this, by our model, our model would say now we have a perception of two. And move again a little bit, and we again shift the perceptual frames, and now again they fall into one cycle here, and we again would have the perception of one. And you can already see where this will lead to. So if we continue with this, then we would have a kind of an oscillating perception. Okay, so this is what our model would predict, kind of an oscillating perception by the subliminal stimulus. And it would also predict that this frequency, this modulation in the um, uh, behavioral data, it should match the frequency of these perceptual frames or perceptual neuron oscillations. So this is what we found. So here's the target stimulus, and here's the time point of the presentation of the subliminal stimulus. So if we presented, for example, at uh, 600 milliseconds before stimuli, stimulation, we see um, a mean response of 1.8. If we move it a little bit closer, perception goes down. If we move it a again a little bit closer to the target stimuli, it goes up. And then you can see this oscillating pattern. So just as predicted, but it's not ideally as we have expected from our model, so a little bit noisier. So in the end of the question is, is this really a rhythmic modulation or is this just noise? So we did a Fourier transformation on these behavioral data. So and if this would be just noise, then we would expect here a flat line in the spectrum. But if there is a real oscill oscillatory pattern here, a rhythmic pattern, then we would expect somewhere a peak here in this pattern, in this spectrum. And that is exactly what we find across all subjects. We find that here between 13 and 18 hertz, we find a, a peak, meaning um, across all subjects on average, there is a rhythmic modulation of roughly 13 to 18 hertz in the beta band. Okay. So again, this is in line with our model of discrete perception. So. And if you remember, our prediction was also that we have an identical frequency between the behavior here, 13 to 18, and the neuronal data of phase modulations here between 10 and 22 hertz. And I, at least in my subjective opinion, this is a fairly decent match between these phase effects we find in the neuronal data in the phase and, and the rhythmic component we find in the, in the behavior data. So, but um, so this whole model is uh, in line with uh, the idea that there is a phase reset induced by the supplement stimulus, but actually we don't know it whether this really occurred. So, um, a phase reset can be can, can be quantified by so-called intertrial phase coherence. So you take a certain a specific time point, and then you can um, analyze the phase of the neuronal oscillations. And then you sum up this um, this phases across all trials. So, and if it's completely random across all trials, then you would expect a resulting vector of close length close to zero. But if you induce a phase reset here at some point, then all the phases the phases should be similar across trials, and then we should expect um, a long resulting vector if we add up all these. All these vectors. So ideally, this would have a length of one, but in, in noisy data, of course, it's, it's, it's not one, it's shorter. The critical thing is the phase reset should be higher than here in random data. Okay, so we took our data from the MG experiment with the supplement stimulus, and then we analyzed the intertrial phase coherence. And here you see a single subject. Here, time point zero is the onset of the supplemental stimulus. And here we see a clear um, clear cluster of higher ITPC in the beta band, so between roughly 15 to 25 hertz. So the problem is um, why I show, so the, the, the reason why I show you single subject data and not um, data across all subjects is because the exact time of frequency across all subjects varied a lot. So here is a second subject with a clear cluster of 
a high ITPC, but here it's in the alpha band, so not overlapping with this subject. And if we, if I would show you, uh, sh could show you other subject, then you would see again in all subjects clusters of IT high ITPC, but at slightly different time frequency points and rough um, in in the end not overlapping. So, but what we could do is that we could take the single subject fre frequency of this ITPC and the frequency of the behavior modulation. So, and as I said before, our model predicts a match between these two. And here we can see a nice significant correlation. So the higher the, the ITPC, the higher is the frequency in the behavior data and vice versa. Okay. So um, this is also um, nicely in line with the model of discrete frames. So finally, um, I would like to present you another study where we uh, thought we uh, why not modulate the frequency of the neural estimations and measure the impact on on pe perception. So the basic idea is that in our brain we have kind of a standard I call it just a roughly standard frequency, uh, which is relevant for perception. And as said before, if these two stimuli fall into two cycles, uh, they, we will have a perception of two. But what would happen now if we could prolong this frequency uh, or prolong the, the cycles? So like this, so we decrease the frequency and prolong the cycles. So now the same stimuli, they would fall within one cycle and we would have a perception of two. So this would be a nice, um, nice test of our model if we could increase or decrease the ongoing frequency. So here in this study, we thought, okay, let's take an patient group with a hepatic encephalopathy, short HE. So they come to the clinic with a liver cirrhosis. And we know that this liver cirrhosis in the end has an effect on the brain. And the effect on the brain is that we have just this um, um, decrease. Uh, it's a decrease of the frequency, so longer uh, cycles. So that is exactly what we wanted to, to have. So our model prediction would be that these people with the HE, due to the longer cycles of neuronal oscillation, should be impaired in their perception. So this has already been shown in the visual modality. So for example, if you present um, a appearing a reappearing um, dot with a uh, frequency of 35 Hertz, then you see this flickering. But if you increase the frequency up to 60 Hertz, then this flickering is gone and you just see a static um, dot. So this is known from um, yeah, this is a fact, and uh, this is the effect we uh, basically use in the cinema or in the movies. Um, so that where the static frames are presented with a frequency of 60 hertz, and you don't see the flickering anymore, but a static uh, picture, right? So we know from uh, other studies here, yeah, you can see on the x axis, um, and so on the uh, uh, so uh, one step back, sorry. So we, get, we can now measure in individual start subjects and uh, we can decrease the frequency of a flicker and at some point it starts flickering. So we can measure this flickering, which is called the critical flicker, flick, flicker frequency, sorry, CFF. So if we now measure the CFF in controls, it's roughly uh, at 40, 42 Hertz. And if we now look at HE patients here with uh, increasing severity of the disease, we see that the CFF constantly decreases. So that means if you can't see this flickering at 35 Hertz here on the left side, maybe you should see your doctor and check your liver. Okay, um, so what we did here, we um, used our uh, now well-known paradigm of the two tactile stimuli, measured the brain activity. And yeah, first of all, let's have a look at the behavior data, just as predicted from the data from the visual modality and from this prolonged um, alpha os uh, um, oscillations, we saw exactly what we expected. So we saw that this critical SOA, that is the SOA which is needed between the two tactile stimuli to be perceived as two stimuli, that this is prolonged in the patient group of HE. Okay. So then we had a look at the peak frequencies and then you can see if we just um, 
yeah, measure the peak frequency. So that is the frequency with the highest power and then subtract the peak frequency of controls and HE patients. We see this uh, difference. So HE patients have a lower peak frequency than controls. Okay, and here we can show that this is the fact basically for all parietal occipital temporal and roughly a little bit in the Sumatra sensory modalities. So mainly sensory cortices roughly. So then we had a look at the correlation. So this is what our model predicted. So that we should see a correlation between the frequency and the perception. So the lower the frequency, the worse the perception. So we would expect negative correlation. And if we do this now for all brain regions, take the peak frequency and correlate it with the individual perception, then we see in these blue areas, this negative correlation, just like as expected. So, and if we take a closer look, um, um, uh, the correlation across all these significant cluster summed up, then we see red patients, blue controls, we see this negative correlation. And if we take a closer look just as, as in S1 cortex, we also see this nice correlation as predicted by our model. So increasing the frequency, um, no, sorry, the other way around, decreasing the frequency in, in subjects had the predicted, predicted, predicted effect that perception was impaired. Okay. So we have done this before in the visual modality and we find a similar correlation. So this is now a little bit different um, presentation. So here we, on the x-axis, we have the alpha band frequency and here we have the CFF, which is the measure in the visual modality. And then we also see this nice correlation between peak frequency and perception. Okay. So let me finally summarize the results of my work. So we have seen at the beginning with alpha power that several studies find um, correlation between alpha power and perception. So previous studies in with near threshold detection task, and we could expand this knowledge and find these results also for temporal discrimination task across modalities in visual and tactile and visual tactile task. So, um, but yeah, but our current study um, is in preparation. This um, questions these results whether there is really a causality between alpha power and and this perception, or whether it's just um, a, correlate, a correlative uh, evidence. So then I have shown you some uh, studies um, investigating in the phase, mainly in the alpha beta. Um, range. We could show that this phase correlates with temporal tactile perception and that subliminal stimuli modulate this perception rhythmically and they induce a phase reset, which is all in line with our model. And finally, with this HE patient group study, we could show that in HE we see decreased frequency and in line with the model we find impaired perception. And we find this nice negative correlation between frequency and perception. So that means um, the results of the phase and frequency, they are pretty much in line with models of discrete perception cycles and temporal integration windows. But there are also a lot of buts. So the story is not that clear as it might seem on, on the first glance. So um, for example, in the HE study, we found this correlation across groups of patients and controls, but we hardly find any of these correlations uh, within each group. And we also find that the frequencies uh, here in this HE group do not really match the frequency of this perceptual um, uh, modulation or impairment, as we have seen before in the healthy groups. So um, one reason might be that maybe peak frequency is not really a valid measure as we have suggested in our previous studies. And maybe we should have a closer look at the phases as we have done in our study with, with the healthy controls. And also for the supplement stimuli, um, a lot of studies, especially uh, from the Leipzig group, um, have shown that supplement stimulus uh, also modulate alpha power. So um, that we have seen before alpha power also uh, influences perception or can influence perception. So 
Um, I haven't looked at alpha power in my studies so far, so but that might also be an additional reason or an additional factor that could modulate perception here. So maybe alpha power and uh, these rhythmic um, and the phase modulations are not completely independent of each other, and this has to be investigated in future studies. So, but anyway, we have shown with the supplemental stimuli that there needs to be a rhythmic modulation in the stimuli, um, or the, we see the rhythmic modulation of the perception. So there needs to be a rhythmic modulation, and that is difficult to to imagine how alpha power could do this rhythm modulation. So the only thing I can at the moment think of is that the face does this rhythmic modulation. So, and I don't want to hide from you that uh, although we find some face effects, there are a lot of um, and some other studies which claim that they did not find face effects on perception. So. Chris Benwell, for example, or even Nico Bush, who had found face effects in other studies, he does not find face effects. So it's not that clear that face effects are always present. So maybe the reason why some find it, some, some not, might be that face is a local phenomenon and can be only found in uh, more local areas. And so, and if you do a whole brain analysis, you might miss these uh, effects. And also phase effects might also be found only if you're really at the threshold of perception and if you're not really at the threshold, so um, other effects might overshadow phase effects. So it's really um, a matter of the task, maybe whether you can see this phase effects or not. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank all my people who uh, collaborated in these studies, so especially here uh, Thomas Baumgarten, who has done a lot of uh, these studies, uh, a lot of these analysis in my studies, um, and also my other colleagues here. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>